Tenakoto Katoa. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Tia Kinakori today. As part of that team, I'm here to talk about some of the ways that we partner with others to protect Kori and the people who care for it. As we all know, Kori is under threat by a pathogen that causes a deadly disease. The pathogen is called Phytophthora agathodicida, and it causes a disease that puts its host into extreme nutrient stress. Phytophthora translates from Latin to plant destroyer. Kori is the only known host for Phytophthora agathodicida which is a mouthful, so I will call it PA today. It's an umaisi, which is a water mold. It travels freely through water via swimming zoospores. We don't know exactly when the pathogen was introduced, but we have some clues about the introduction history and spread. PA was first detected, although misidentified at the time, in 1972 on Aotea under symptomatic and asymptomatic trees. It wasn't considered to be a big threat at that point. The disease, linked to the same pathogen, was found in Auckland in 2006, causing significant damage to Kari, but no other species. This time, PA was considered to be dangerous and a great threat to Kari, which is why we're here talking about it today, 17 years later. But the pathogen isn't the first threat that Kauri has encountered. Early logging activities threatened Kauri long before any of us were here. And as we know, Kauri is prized for its timber, both the quality and quantity, so it was extensively logged beginning in the early to mid-1800s. Now only 1% of the natural Kauri forests remain. It's thought that some of the repurposed logging equipment that came from the Pacific after World War II may have been infested and spread PA. It was also likely spread through road construction and other disturbances related to logging. It's an undeniable fact that habitat fragmentation and disturbance at this scale makes Kauri vulnerable to new environmental threats, both natural and man-made. And the impacts of historical logging and that disturbance persist today. What you're looking at here is a map from a large-scale prevalence study in the Waitakere Range, coordinated by Auckland Council. You'll see some black dots sprinkled around the forest in this map. These indicate a random selection of 2,500 trees, which were assessed for health and soil sampled by experienced technicians from Biosense. The red circles represent historical logging sites. On this map, you can see the results from the PA prevalence model from that sampling of trees. Blue dots show surveyed trees where PA was not detected in soil, and red dots show the areas where the pathogen was detected. If you compare both maps, you can see the correlation they found between logging sites and PA detection. Now, this is just a correlation, and the higher prevalence of these sites are likely to be caused by multiple factors, but the relationship suggests that logging was likely an introduction pathway and also a big disturbance to Kauri, making it more vulnerable to disease. And here's a chart from that study showing the other factors that correlated with pathogen prevalence. Pathogen prevalence declined with increasing elevation and with increasing distance from neighboring trees, historic timber sites, the coastline tracks, and Tanikaha. These factors need more testing to confirm causation, but we can hypothesize that once the pathogen is present and successful in an area, these environmental factors may predict higher pathogen prevalence. What's interesting about these factors, though, is that they're indicators of disturbance and regeneration. So even though most sound like environmental factors, they are more likely to be human-caused. Introduced vectors are another threat. There have been over 35 species of mammals introduced, and they have transformed kari forests, and many have the ability to vector the pathogen. Pigs are a big concern for, um, in kari forests. They cause extensive damage around kari trunks and disturb their shallow roots. And the management of these vectors can also cause a threat. There are extensive trapping programs across Kauri lands, which have saved a lot of birds and improved forest regeneration. Unfortunately, though, humans can vector the pathogen with their shoes and gear when they check trap lines. Nurseries are one of our greatest threats to Kauri. For example, there's evidence that PA was spread to plantation sites from the Waipoa Forest Nursery in the mid-1950s. Small, local nurseries using stream water to irrigate can be dangerous, since Phytophthora live and travel in water so well. Even though Kauri is the only known host, the pathogen can persist in soils of almost any nursery plant, so all nursery stock should be treated as if it could be a vector. With all the fantastic conservation work going on, we expect more and more people to be planting natives, and it's important to do this safely. Commercial nurseries present the potential for long-distance introductions uh, within the country. This is a visual 
actual example of how that happened with Phytophthora remorum in California. That pathogen escaped from nurseries and wreaked havoc over native systems in the US. This map shows an attempt at tracing that movement. If infected materials move out of nurseries, they can start new invasions very quickly and disperse widely. Because Phytophthoras are so happy in warm, wet nurseries, they're often sources of inoculum. In fact, studies from Europe, the US, and Australia have shown that over 90% of nurseries contain Phytophthoras. The last challenge I'll discuss is a lack of information. We don't know the spatial distribution of our host population at risk or where the pathogen is distributed. This threat limits our ability as managers to protect kauri effectively. We have rough maps like this one seen here, but our goal is to protect as many trees as possible, and we can't do that unless we know where they are, their health status, and pathogen presence or absence. Okay, so I'm finished covering off the doom and gloom section, the threats and challenges. Fortunately, many of these threats can be managed, and so for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on the positive things we're doing to overcome and mitigate these threats and challenges, which we do through partnership and working together. And what structures our work are, are treaty obligations and a piece of legislation passed last year called the National Pest Management Plan for PA. It's the strongest form of protection under the Biosecurity Act of 1993 and is broadly aimed at protecting Kari and the people who care for it. This is accomplished through a set of rules and principal measures summarized here. I won't read this list out, but I'll spend the rest of this talk providing some examples of how we are working with our partners to protect Kari through this plan. One of the leading principal measures of the plan is this one, to grow awareness, partnerships, and hapu and iwi-led collaboration and engagement in the management of PA. The process begins with gaining permission from Mauna Whenua through regionally-based staff to collaborate and partner in the management of PA. This is led by our operations team of Mita, Mike and Brian in the north, and Tony in the Coromandel. In addition to that measure, we have another to increase public and industry engagement in the management of PA. Polly Pryor, our communication and engagement lead, has been developing a national engagement campaign aimed at restarting a positive national conversation about Kauri and to raise awareness of the NPMP rules. This campaign targets a broad group, including Māori, rural landowners, plant growers, forest users, and the general public using channels such as billboards, videos, radio, social media, and other digital formats. Increasing awareness and public engagement also occurs at track entrances where we support hygiene standards and programs aimed at reducing the potential for PA spread into and out of the forest. Our partners at DOC and councils have probably made the biggest investments in these stations, which require a lot of maintenance. DOC are, are also involved with testing soils for live pathogen propagules around these stations to make sure they're working the way we need them to. Ongoing research is being funded to improve hygiene tools and protocols. Now, as I mentioned, nurseries are a big cause for concern for Kauri. The NPMP imposes movement controls on risk items that are or may be capable of contributing to the spread of PA. We are partnering with Plant Pass, a voluntary certification scheme to help nurseries manage biosecurity risks. This is an end-to-end -end program that offers specific modules to guide with safe plant production measures that includes a Kauri specific module that aligns with the NPMP. In conjunction with Plant Pass is the Plant Buyers Accord, which is a growing network of leaders who champion Plant Pass. One of the Accord champions is Shelley Aston from Biosecurity New Zealand, who is standing by a Plant Pass booth at the conference, so please stop in and ask her for more questions about Plant Pass and the Plant Buyers Accord. The NPMP contains a rule about plant movement. People growing kauri are now mandated to test any plants that look sick before they can leave the facility. Now, this creates a big challenge for us in implementation and compliance because we don't yet have an appropriate diagnostic test or a testing protocol for nurseries to meet this requirement. To overcome this challenge, we've engaged with local and international experts who are sharing their knowledge and research outputs. We've contracted Scion to develop a testing protocol using leachate from plant pots. Now, this is a standard testing method used around the world, but we don't have a protocol for Kauri, and we want one that's easy to follow. We will publish this in a best practices guide for nurseries. We are also working to improve our diagnostic testing capability by optimizing and accrediting a molecular test which is more sensitive to PA detection. This will improve Kauri protection activities from nurseries and across the board. Another priority is to develop a test that can consistently detect all of the life stages of the pathogen. Current tests are not optimized to do that. And the good news is we're seeing exciting progress in that area.
The NPMP has a strong focus on surveillance to fill the knowledge gap we have in baseline information about the spatial distribution of Kauri and the pathogen. There are several measures outlined under this category. We have a goal of mapping the distribution of Kauri and Kauri forests, mapping the presence or absence of PA, and determining and establishing special risk areas and Kauri protection areas. Again, we've consulted with a group of national and international surveillance experts to help us reach these goals, and Mana Fenua are our main end user group who are walking, working across private and dock managed lands. We're sharing these tools, maps, and methods with Kaitiaki from Iwi and Hapu to empower their Kauri protection activities. Councils have already done a lot of impressive work in this area as well and are sharing their learnings. Now, there are many ways and types of imagery that we can use to achieve the goal of mapping Kari. For example, we can map forests at the stand level. This is the level of detail we have currently. Kari forests are highlighted in gold. Stand level mapping is useful because it provides a big picture idea of where the largest stands are. We can increase the level of detail by using publicly available, previously acquired imagery called Sentinel data. Here's a map produced by James Shepard from Anaki Fenua, who is shown below demonstrating this method to Tai Tamariki. He's using that imagery to delineate stands of kauri from other types of tree stands. This can help us identify not only large stands, but smaller ones as well that might need protection. But we need higher resolution imagery to identify individual kauri. We've partnered with several aerial surveillance providers to capture this imagery over kauri lands. These images can be used to identify individual kauri, but also to detect canopy stress. We're slowly but surely getting this information into maps that people can use on the ground. This project has not been easy since the pilots require clear sunny days to capture images. Now anyone who's looked out a window over the past three years of La Nina knows how rare those long spells of sun have been. But once we have that imagery, we can identify cloudy crowns at this level of detail like they did in the Waitakere. And once we have the Kauri population mapped, there are a number of different things we can do. One is a pre prevalence study like the one Auckland Council did in the Waitakere Range. Their Kauri crown distribution map allowed them to take that randomly selected sample of trees to survey. The results of the study taught us a lot about the presence and absence of PA across the range and identified some of the risk factors associated with pathogen spread. This is a great way to map pathogen prevalence, but takes a really large amount of resources and it can impose a risk to Kauri through all of the movement movement through the forest, so we don't want to do this everywhere. Another way we can use Kauri distribution data is to map the risks around the trees. We do that by taking those known and hypothesized risks and charting them over the Kauri layer. This map just shows an example of one of those risks we might add to a map. These are trap lines, which pose a movement risk. Risk mapping helps us to hone in on targeted surveillance sites of interest. We can also develop sampling plans around risks to validate them. This risk-based approach is the one we hope to deliver nationally and are beginning this approach in Northland with the help and guidance of researchers in the integrated surveillance theme at Naraku Takataki. Cecilia Latham from Anaki Fenua will talk more about this approach later, but with their help, we are delivering maps to Mana Fenua across Kari lands to guide ground surveillance activities. One of the objectives of the surveillance program is to identify candidate areas for protection or special risk areas. A Kauri protection area is one where we can ensure pathogen freedom and then implement management strategies to ensure that they remain pathogen free. A special risk area is a place where we see a lot of risk for pathogen spread or where there is a lot of disease present in the area already and we want to contain it. We're working with our partners to develop the criteria for establishing these areas. Now, management of both types of areas might be pretty similar. Keep them vector free, divert tracks and trap lines and other measures like that. But delineation and ground truthing is the first important step, which is guided by our maps and aerial surveillance information. In order to do the on the ground truthing successfully, we work together to ensure we collect clear and consistent quality data. So we have initiated a training program aimed at sharing basic surveillance skills and hygiene so the work can be done safely. After engagement and gaining permission to work with our partners from Iwi and Hapu across Kauri lands, we've begun this work in Northland. We do this in consultation with both Mana Fenua and DOC when they are the managing agency. The training, besides basic um, ground truthing, includes basic hygiene techniques, how to move safely through a Kauri forest, and what types of solutions to use to clean gear and clothing. We're developing a video to supplement this training.
We've contracted our friends at Biosense to coordinate and implement this training. Fred Yelm, shown here, has worked tirelessly to implement this training. He has surveyed tens of thousands of trees, so is passing on his knowledge to our Manapanoa partners so they can do the work as well, teaching them how to identify symptoms and collect soil in a way that will increase the chances of finding the pathogen if it is there. So far, 10 people are fully trained to perform safe and effective ground surveillance. This work will always be evolving and standard operating procedures will be improved over time. One thing we found when the Kore Protection Program restarted was that there were holes in some of our standard operating procedures, including how we collect soil samples. So we gathered lots of managers together in Hui to come to agreement on how best to perform procedures such as soil and root sampling, soil testing, and best practices for hygiene. These are now the standards and we expect broad acceptance. New standard operating procedures will be published to our website as they are approved and trainees will have access to refresher training each year to get up to speed with changes. Our partners always establish a clear purpose prior to undertaking surveillance, but the purpose may differ for different groups. For example, this is Sid Bristow in yellow from Veranaki. His rohe is unique because trees there are mostly regenerating and don't pop out over the canopy, so they aren't picked up very well through aerial surveillance. Sid and his nephew Moriora are mapping trees and surveying them in targeted areas with the purpose of creating maps they can share with others from his iwi and communicate where the risks are. One thing Sid would like is a map showing no-go risk areas for pig hunters, for example. Pukati Forest, on the other hand, is a very large area with loads of large kauri that can be detected from aerial imagery. The challenge here is that it's a huge remote area. Aerial surveillance data allows managers like Tanya Penne from Napui to break up areas into discrete manageable units like subcatchments. It can inform how to manage vectors around large tracts of healthy or unhealthy forest or guide where trap lines should be put in or diverted. Breaking areas up into subcatchments or quarry protection areas also helps managers plan to help them understand the capacity needed to do the work. Before we begin any planned surveillance, there are important questions we discuss as a partnership team. We've drafted a communication and investigation plan to facilitate this to ensure transparency, clarity, and fairness. This plan was spearheaded by Karen Froud, who worked with us and the team at Auckland Council, our Mana Whenua partners, and Doc Shadavella. The plan contains a number of prompts for discussion. I've just highlighted a few here. We identify the partners that need to be aware of surveillance and seek permission to work. We determine what public engagement is necessary. Signs, social media, for example. We identify private landowners at forest boundaries to make them aware of planned surveillance activities. And we discuss where planned surveillance will take place and how plans will be communicated with each other. We also need to ensure that data is managed safely, equitably, and appropriately. We discuss these issues with our partners, including what data is collected, who requires access to the data, and what platforms will be used to hold the data and how will access be managed. We've contracted LINS to develop a data containment system protected by firewall to make surveillance data accessible and usable for the people who need it. We hope to migrate as much information about Kauri and PA to this platform as we can to form a secure picture of Kauri health across Kauri lands. We deal with positive detections in partnership and help each other to be prepared for potential bad news before it comes. A positive screening test could have high consequences. It could be devastating to find the pathogen somewhere you thought was protected. It could become political if a positive detection is close to a shared boundary. So we discuss things like, what are the expectations for reporting positive results in areas believed to be free of PA? And who are the partners to be notified? We've developed an investigation plan that can be used to validate results if you believe a test result is incorrect. So we discuss what is the validation process for investigating potential or false positives. And we describe the communication plan for a confirmed detection. Who are those partners requiring notification and how do we notify them? If someone outside the surveillance circle needs access to data, who do we put them in touch with? I want to conclude with this photo of Rangatahi. This group of Thai Tamariki traveled from the far north to Lincoln University for a program focused on Kari protection. Maori-led projects like these are occurring across Kari lands and should give us a lot of hope for the future. And with that, I thank you all for listening and please feel free to email with any questions.